Hello and welcome to this video and this video is going to be called my 10 favorite guitar shred masters all right um so i've recently done a video which you can check out i might put a link in the end of this video which was looking at the 10 greatest guitar gods and we looked at hendrix and beck and page and all that and then a lot of people started to mention a whole bunch of 80s guitarists who I tried to represent with by Steve Vai, who um, I think is all encompassing when it comes to sort of those 80s shred guitarists that emerged in that decade that seemed to take over rock for a while. Um, I can remember, um, I was at university around about 1988, I think, 87, 88, 89. And I can remember coming back to my hometown and, and I went out for a drink down the pub and um, when I got there, my town was not, was just a small town. People weren't, you know, they're not cosmopolitan people. They're just regular people. They like the stuff that's in the charts, you know, and, you know, that's what my town was like. You know, and I went down the pub and I stood at the bar and three girls was there talking about Steve Vai's latest single that was on MTV. That was a moment for me when I realized that these guitar, 80s guitar shred masters had taken over the world, right? And uh, for me, it's always been Steve Vai is, is the main guy, right? Some of these guitarists got mentioned when I was, we were talking about rock gods. So I really want to talk about, you know, those 80s guitar shred masters. I want to talk about the ones I liked. This is my top 10. It's not an objective. It is actually, well, sort of my, this is why it's called my favorite ones. Um, and I've ranked them. And I've, I've sort of ranked them in order of shred, shreddiness. Um, as, uh, that's an important factor on this list. But also how far they took the guitar out, their influence, um, a whole bunch of uh, things like commercial success, but also how the, the regard they're held in the guitar community, because I think that's also really needs to be factored in on this video. Um, before I start, there's a couple... Well, there's three guitarists that I want to mention. And, and I've called these the three gods of shred. And they're not on the list, right? So these three gods of shred are not part of this list. They sit above this list, looking down upon this list. Looking down at what they begat, all right? And those three guitarists are John McGoughlin, Aldi Miola, Alan Holdsworth. So they're not on the list. So you don't have to. They're, they're, like a, they're above this list, right? All those of you who want to put Aldi Miola in or Alan Holdsworth, yeah, they, they are not on this list. They're floating above looking down at the children of their shred, okay? And at the end, I've got some honourable mentions as well because there was a ton of guitarists I wanted to put on this list. Right, so um, the other thing I haven't done is I haven't included... Um, Oh, I don't think I've included any guitarists of from now. You know what I'm like. There's hardly any anything from contemporary music on my channel, um, except for one guitarist, because I just think this guitarist, and you know who it's going to be if you watch the channel, has just taken the whole idea of Shred and taken it to another level. There's some incredible guitarists around today that are really playing some incredible, you know, Play, you know, guitar playing. I'm thinking it's like Alice Hutchings. I'm thinking of Guthrie Govan, um, um, Matteo Mancuso. Um, there's a whole, some incredible guitarists. Um, and they're doing some interesting stuff. Um, but I, in terms of taking what these 80s guitarists did, have done and pushing it further out, I'm not too sure whether they have done that or whether they've just neatened and neatened it all up and dot the I's and cross the T's. So um, I haven't got any of those guitarists on, but that's another video. It'd be lovely at some point to uh, do my sort of favorite contemporary guitarists around today, and I may do that. Um, but at number 10, I have got one guy on the list, and I really thought, shall I put him on the list, or shall I not put him on the list? And that guitarist is, at number 10, Roy Marchbank. Um, and I was worried about putting him at number 10. In terms of just pure shredding, you know, this guy would be number one. Uh, you know, I think Roy has taken a lot of the ideas from the guitarists on this list and he's just taken it so much further out. Um, and for doing that, he has um, got a lot of flack. Uh, the gatekeepers 
from the gatekeepers of the memories of some of the guitarists on this list who they do, don't, I think, want the crown of being the fastest guitarist in the world taken away from them, uh, and which is quite ridiculous. Um, I, I saw Roy, and I've always had an interest in this type of guitar playing, and when I saw what Roy was doing, what struck me is, yeah, there's incredible facility, he's incredibly fast alternate picking, and he's incredibly fast with legato technique, but behind that was a whole bunch of other concepts that were even more advanced. He wasn't just sitting on the, tr the tradition, he hadn't decided to go down the jazz route and just you know, show off his ability to play through changes. He hadn't just decided to go down the metal route and just spin out, you know, three bump with per string licks very, very fast. He was he was plowing his own course in terms of his guitar tone, the techniques he was using, his, his compositional approaches. And this really impressed me. And uh, I did a video on Roy because I thought he was fantastic. And Roy then got in touch. And, and now, uh, myself and Roy have um, become great friends and I've been able to talk to him a lot and a lot of the conversations that we've had have informed the thoughts on this video as we go forward. Um, and of course, the idea of rating guitarists on how fast they are is truly preposterous. And all the guitarists on this list are not here because they play fast. Chris Impatelli is not on this list, you know. It's all about personality in music. Um, and I think Roy has that in buckets. So this is why I've got him at number 10. I haven't put him any higher because he hasn't been around as much and has done as much as some of these legends that are on this list. But uh, a big shout out for Roy on my channel again. And um, hopefully if you watch this space, there will be something in the future from me and Roy. You know, um, we've, we've been working on a few ideas. I'm not gonna say any more than that, but I am gonna whet your appetite for that. Um, and that's it, I'm gonna move on now. So who have I got at number nine? All right, so at number nine, I have one of the sort of classic 80s shred masters, and that's Greg Howe. Greg Howe came out with a self-titled album in the mid to late 80s. I was buying up all these albums by these guitarists at that point. Uh, me being a fusion guy, what impressed me with Greg Howe was the fusion tendencies you know Atma and uh, on drums was also he was like playing all that double bass drum stuff but he had a swing and he and he had an ability to to you know play outside the time like a jazz drummer and i i absolutely love that album um greg howe has since gone on to i think move from being a metal shred master guitarist he's moved over into jazz fusion and um, a lot of the jazz fusion followers on this channel will often champion Greg, which I totally agree with. Um, I think as a solo artist, he's, he's been great. And as a side, a side man, he's been great. I think um, he combines a whole host of things which um, not every shreddy 80s guitarist have. I think one of that is he's got a beautiful touch. He's got that bluesy bends. He's, he's got the jazz phrasing. He's also got the harmonic vocabulary and he's got the fire, he knows how to kick it up and play, you know, he, he knows how to get on that jazz wave and, uh, you know, surf his way through. As I say this, I realise I have a big surfboard sticking out my head as I say that. Uh, and I think that's what great guitarists have, you know, is that ability to get on that energy wave, connect and be able to sit on it and traverse it. The guitarists who play fast who haven't got that, it just sounds like a just a shallow display of speed, which is only there to impress. But the great guitarist can sort of harness energy. And I think Greg Howe's got that, and I think he's got better at that as time has gone on. So that's who I've got at number nine, is Greg Howe. Right, at number eight, I have one of my favorite rock guitarists of all time. And uh, this guy, not only is a fantastic guitar player, but he has the charisma and he has the looks, which I think is essential to be a guitar god. He could have well got on my guitar god list if there wasn't such incredible gods on that list already. At number eight, I have Nuno Betancourt. Um, I was a huge Steve Vai fan, and I've had to really fight in not putting Steve Vai top of this list. Um, and there's a, I'll explain that when I get there, uh, and I'll... We'll get there, but uh, he's not even near the top of the list. I've I've put Steve Vai at the top of so many lists, but I think when we're just talking about sheer shredding, 
there's a few guitarists that we just need to put in above perhaps um, but you know my favorite of these 80s guitars was Steve Vai and um, when Steve and Mark Vai then came out with um, Passion of Warfare and it sold a million copies he uh, it was all encompassing you know um, he was playing with Whitesnake he'd played with David Lee Roth he was on the front of magazines and like I said you had he had girls talking about him in pubs right um, which, which never ever happened it never happened to John Schofield that never happened <laughs> so uh, uh, and I started looking around for the next guy who's going to be the next guy you know is it going to be Greg Howe is it going to be Vinnie Moore who is it and um, I remember I picked up the album by Extreme um, Pornography, Pornography -ty, and I saw the video and there was this guy that looked incredible you know absolutely amazing looking bloke who you know was singing had a great voice um, and then when he played the guitar it was absolutely astonishing and Nuno does not fall in to what everyone else was doing there's, a, there's, a, there, there's more rock and roll there but in a way there's more virtuosity as well he, he'll, he'll, he'll play a, a, a you know, bog standard rock guitar solo at the start and then he seems to take it off and he, he's able to take that energy and move it up and up. I was absolutely blown away by his playing on that Extreme album. And I think the fact that he emerged as a guitarist in a band. All the great guitarists need a band. You know, I think um, if Steve Vai had not been in uh, the David Lee Roth band or Alcatraz, you know, if, if Mal Malmsteen hadn't been in Alcatraz, if Paul Gilbert hadn't been in, you know, Mr. Big... If, if Marty Friedman hadn't been in <coughs> Megadeth, then they would not have, have achieved uh, that greatness. I think to have a popular rock band with a large fan base, but where, you know, us guitar fans could buy that album and really, you know, focus in what they're going to do on the next guitar. So that, that was part of this 80s experience. And Nuno Betancourt just delivered that brilliantly on on that extreme album pornography pornography et and also there was almost like that eruption moment where he did that little guitar so it was absolutely astonishing where i think he he'd linked the guitar up to a, to a drum machine and he was able to really create an incredible sound like that you know he's he nuno's got a touch of the van halens about him he's exploratory uh and he's got a touch of the rock and roll about him i absolutely love him um I, I can remember another story that gives really gives you context about how these guitarists were perceived in the 80s. Um, Extreme came to my, when I was at college, they came to Wolverhampton and played a gig there and, and I, I, I went to see them. But I went over to my friend's house and he lived in a student house full of girls, you know, and on the wall, they had the, the wall of handsome men and they put up all these pictures they got Matt Dillon on there I think they got Steve, uh, Paul Newman was on there it was a whole bunch of men that they they were just their favorite men which I, I applaud very much I think that's a good thing you know for them to do at that time I think it was a uh, you know good for them to express their their likes of certain men and on that wall right in the middle was a big poster of Nuno Betancourt and I realized how these people have crossed over into the mainstream culture right and that's a really incredible thing because they're fantastic musicians and that moment in the 80s when these guitarists really ruled the world gave such a kick up the bum of music at that time and so many musicians of my age actually having those musicians there pushed us to raise our level up technically on our instruments there's so many players I think that really owe it to the guitarists on this list and Nuno is one of those at number seven we have the great Paul Gilbert you know Paul Gilbert from Racer X and then later he was uh, the guitarist in uh, Mr Big you know where he had his big stadium rock moment Paul Gilbert possesses an incredible technique on the guitar hey um but the thing I like about Paul Gilbert is his sense of humour. That's the thing that really impressed me. Um, at the time, all these guitarists were bringing out their tuition videos and all us 
you know, budding guitarists in the 80s, we would all have a couple of these videos. So if we all got together, we could all put them together. So I ended up seeing all the videos. And the one that everyone came back to over and over again was the Paul Gilbert video, because it was so funny and yet so full of brilliant shred advice, you know. And I think more than any other video, maybe Gambali, you know, um, his, his, um, what was his video called? I know there was Modes No More Mystery, but they had a big effect on us. But if it was a Paul Gilbert video, um, I went to see Paul Gilbert play live um, and he did the whole drill thing where he had the, you know, and it's all taking the mickey out the whole shred. And I love that. And I'm like this on this channel. I take the mickey out the whole, you know, notion of doing top 10 videos, as you know. Uh, and there he was with his drill with the plectrum spinning around doing all that. Um, I can remember he did, he was playing a guitar solo and then he starts doing this incredible guitar solo with his teeth, it seemed. And then as he bends forward, we could see that he was just basically singing a guitar solo into his pickups. Absolutely incredible moment. Um, he came out and did a version of Two Become One by the Spice Girls, which sounded like a, an awesome rock ballad, you know, with an incredible guitar solo. So that's who I've got at, um, at number seven is Paul Gilbert. Um, great technician, great sense of humour, and I love anybody in music that's got a sense of humour. Right, so who have I got above um, Paul Gilbert? Well, at number six, I have the great Joe Satriani. There he is. Here he is. With this is this has got to be the album, isn't it? You know, where do I put it up? You know, I'm going to hold that there so I don't have to put my little graphic up. We have got the real thing that I bought as it came out, and this was a this was such an album. There's there's the man. See, we can have a look at him now. I've got an album. You know, it's nice to have some props. There he is with the rock leg sticking out and the obligatory difficult guitar post hand. Um, I think, um, every, you know, so for the Ailman, Ice Nine, Crushing Day, Always With Me, Always With You, and the incredible Satch Boogie. Satch Boogie is one of the guitar tracks that you had to be able to play. I couldn't play it, you know. But if you were a guitarist in the 80s, you had to be able to play Satch Boogie. Um, Satriani is an interesting musician um, because he really came to prominence because he was Steve Vai's guitar teacher. Um, the first time I heard him was on a flexi disc that was on the cover of Guitar Player magazine and he was billed as, as Steve Vai's guitar teacher and he brought a solo album out which sold because everyone wanted to check out Steve Vai's guitar teacher which, which was not of this earth. Um, I got that album and that was a great album and so his way in worked and in a way Satriani has become the greatest of those guitar shred guys you know he's still going now he's still making albums he's still selling out big shows and and more power to him um, what's interesting with about Joe Satriani jazz fans is that um, he actually had a jazz training coming up when he was a very um, young man. He had lessons with the great Lenny Tristano. Now, Lenny Tristano was not just a great jazz pianist, he was a, he was a, a blind jazz pianist as well, but he was also a great theorist. Uh, Lenny Tristano is perhaps the, the musician that in the late 40s invents free jazz before Ornette Coleman, before Cecil Taylor. Right, this guy was an academic, but he was also an exploratory musician. And, and watching interviews with Joe Satriani, he seemed to have got a hell of a lot out of um, Lenny Tristano's, had, had those lessons with him. And I think he, he, had, he had lessons with another jazz guy as well, which I, I cannot recall at the moment. Um, but rather than being, you know, trained to become sort of Wes Montgomery style jazz guitarist, it seems to have opened him up to be a very exploratory musician. And I think one of the things that Satriani's got, he's an absolutely fantastic writer and he's a great writer of melodies. And a guitarist is nothing if they, especially an instrumental guitarist, he's nothing if he hasn't got some great melodies to play. And I think that's what serves Satriani so well. 
It's all about the tunes, you see. You know, you can have all the chops and all the speed and all that, but if you haven't got the tunes, there's no longevity there. Um, I, um, I sat down with my, my friend John Penny yesterday, and we had a great chat about this. John Penny's the lead singer of Dead's Atomic Dustbin, and he's not impressed with all this showy, offy, fast stuff. He's a straight-down-the-line, post-punk, indie-influenced, you know, rock musician that tries to write economic songs where he tries to get the point across as simply as he can. And he distrusts all this virtuosity. But one of the things we were discussing was that um, in these two sort of opposing um, areas, so you got sort of, if I can get my hands in the middle, you've got sort of proggy, jazz fusion show off, you know, all very creative and uh, um, boundary pushing complex you know that's this one here and then you've got great songs which are simple and to the point and there's brevity there and and everything's been stripped down to just the pure hooks and the lyric and that's really important and it's a little bit like what I always say art's about it's feeling hedonism right against meaning it's form and content and I think the thing is, there's a diff. The thing that makes great song songs great is that they have a little smidgen of the other in there. That experimentation, the boundary pushing, the the extravagance, the virtuosity. You need a little bit in that. That's what makes Elton John, Elton John, and the Bee Gees, the Bee Gees. On what's on what makes them not Milli Vanilli, or whoever the sort of bland pop is that's out there now. It needs a smidgen of that experimentation, virtuosity, interest, boundary pushing, ex you know, exploration in it. But by the same token, here we are over here with the sort of progressive music. If you haven't got that conciseness, if you haven't got that story, if you haven't got the, the hooks and the melody, all the simple stuff, the brevity, the econ economy, if you haven't got that in instrumental music, and I think that fundamentally comes down to it being about something. And I think Satriani is a genius at writing instrumental music, which is about something, you know, he explores something beyond just the music, you know. And here we have the Silver, Stor Silver Surfer there, you know, and that is about that. That's what that album conveys, you know. So that's who I've got at number six is Joe Satriani. And as I said, Joe Satriani was the teacher of the guitarist I've got at number five, very low on the list for me, right? Which is a, a, a Steve Vai. I think Steve Vai is the greatest of these 80s guitarists. And I think he's great because of all the compositions, his image, the sort of extravagance, the, the breadth of music that he plays, the areas he's gone into, all that sort of stuff. As a shred master, Right, I think um, Steve Vai, Steve Vai's virtuosity is much more rooted in that sort of Frank Zappa approach that this guy could just play anything. Um, but I've never felt that Steve Vai really um, has, 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 has rested on the idea of him being a shred master. I think there's something else about him. Um, he's He's got a quirky way of playing the guitar. It, it often sounds like Vi's got a little smile on his face. He's almost like cracking jokes sometimes when he plays, especially in, in the 80s period, you know, us that grew up with him on, you know, the Alcatraz album, Disturbing the Peace, and on, you know, Eat Em and Smile and Skyscraper. I look forward to those solos, not to be impressed by the virtuosity, but, but just to get that sort of quirky humour that he was able to, um, you know, uh, communicate so brilliantly. Um, I think as time's gone on, his, um, his ability to shred has diminished and it's made him a stronger player because he now he, he relies so much on phrasing, on, on, on microtonal bends and being able to get inside the notes. A little bit like Miles Davis does, but he does it in his own way. It's not like Miles Davis, but he's, he's like a Miles Davis. He's become, I think, incredibly, incredibly economic and why he's actually stronger now as a player for me than he was back then. But back then he did have his shred together and there's some incredible, you know, alternate picking. I think if you listen to him on album by Public Image Limited, there's some picking on there, which is quite astonishing. But um, I put him at number five. Um, if you want me to talk about Steve Vai more, then just, you know, go on YouTube and search Andy Edwards Steve Vai. I've done a lot of videos on him and you can get me, the whole video of me talking about I absolutely love the guy. I've seen him many, many times. Um, I've saw with David Rothband, 
Uh, I saw him solo a number of times. I've seen him on the G3 tour a number of times with Satriani. Um, he's, he's, he's a really incredible musician, but I'm now going to move into four up utter shred masters and this forms the basis of this video going forward now so who have i got at number four at number four i have buckethead buckethead sort of almost occupies his own territory in music um it, i i i discovered buckethead very early on you know why because i'm a jazz fan um in the early 90s there's a free, there was a free jazz festival in the early 90s that was put on by Derek Bailey called um, Company and they were bringing all sorts of different free jazz musicians. And I think around about 1991, you know, they bring in this teenage guitarist to come onto Company Week and play with the free jazzers, you know. Derek Bailey, if you don't know him, was a free, great free jazz guitarist that um, was an absolute genius. He wrote a book on improvisation that influenced me greatly. He did a TV series on improvisation, which also influ influenced me greatly. Uh, as a, as um, a guitar explorer, he's probably taken the guitar further out than any other musician that's ever lived. And uh, in the same way that Derek Bailey used to sit there and you know jam along to drum and bass on the radio you know, with free jazz, he liked the idea of bringing in this guitarist. It was a summation of all the stuff we're talking about. But Buckethead had also taken in all these sort of martial arts films and Godzilla movies, and he'd created an image for himself, which was so powerful. Um, I think through the free jazz thing, he seems to then get picked up by uh, Bill Laswell, and Bill Laswell puts a band around him called Praxis, and I, I, um, I, I heard recordings of him in the company week, and then I bought that Praxis album as it came out. And, and Buckethead was absolutely mind-blowing playing incredible speeds uh, but also utilizing a whole host of really strange the techniques that took the guitar beyond um what you would expect from rock into territories of avant-garde jazz industrial electronica um cartoon music um he started to bring some solo albums out and i've got a few they were very hard to get hold of like um um day of the robots and uh, bucket headland that was really hard to get hold of um, but he's since got on to record about 500 solo albums. This guy is an enigma. And of course he performs with the, the sort of white, you know, horror mask on and he's got the KFC bucket on his head. He is unbelievably iconic. I, I really nearly put him on my Rock Gods video, um, list because of how iconic this guy is. Um, and then even though he is so left field, making such, he's without doubt, I'm just checking, yes, he's without doubt the most avant-garde way out musician on this list. Um, most fans of Guitar Shred will mention him, but he's really come from another area. But then he gets the gig with Guns N' Roses, one of the biggest bands in the world, which gave him a platform that really got his, his name out as a sort of almost like a household name for guitar players. Um, if you go out and check out my um, video on Bill Laswell, and look on go through a lot of those albums, he features a lot on there. But one album that um, I really want to mention is an album produced by Bill Laswell under the name of Arcana, and it's called Ark of Testimony, where Buckethead is brought into a band with Tony Williams on drums and Pharaoh Sunders, the late great Pharaoh Sunders on, on saxophone. And this is free jazz fusion. It's an incredible. And it's one of the last truly great fusion albums that have come out in the last 20, 30 years. I, I would say it's a masterpiece. Um, having Buckethead in there is a, is, um, a work of genius. So um, fusion fans who are watching this, go and get Arca Testimony by Arcana and if you want to know more about it go and check out my uh, video on Bill Laswell where I talk about it in much more detail so who have I got at number three well this guy doesn't quite fit on this list but anybody who was listening to those 80s shred guitarists was listening to this guy as well and that is the incredible Frank Gambale Frank Gambale can shred along with absolutely anybody he's, uh, he's third on my list here you know of, 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 of shred masters 
But he's a beautiful guitarist. He's um, he's got all the jazz chops. He can play through changes. Um, but because of my love of Gambali and the amount of interviews I've watched by him and the uh, the um, I've read about him. Frank Gambali could really do absolutely everything, and I feel is he's massively underrated. Um, his want to explore how you play guitar um, help, um, ended up with him developing what we call sweep technique. Now, I have said on this channel that um, Frank Gambali invented sweep technique and people have criticised me for saying that. And you know, as they said, Django Reinhardt would sweep arpeggios. All sorts of guitarists would sweep arpeggios. Um, what Gambali did specifically was create a system where the guitar plectrum never crosses over. This is um, can be sometimes uh, described as economy picking, but economy picking is where you do cross over, but where you don't cross over, you don't. But Gambali created a system where he never crosses over. So when you open up picking, if you imagine you were picking, and this is gonna get a bit technical, and I don't like to get too technical on my channel, but I'm gonna get technical here. If you were picking um, three note per, per string on the guitar, so you start on your bottom string and you go pick down, and then you go to the next one and you pick up, and then you, you go to the next one and you pick down. If you're alternate picking, you then have to move across the string to pick up, right? Now, you could go down, up, down, and then sweep onto the next string, right? And that would be sweep technique. Um, if you started off alternate picking and you went down, up, down, three note string, and then to the next, up, down, up, at this point, you then have to cross over right over the string to come down. And this is a technical issue on guitar. If you, if you, um, read interviews with the likes of Aldi Miola, he will go on about this is the only way to play the guitar and he is so wrong. There's a million ways you can play the guitar and believe me guitarists, you're free to do it however you want. Don't let anybody tell you how to do it. And Gambali with that spirit went, well how you know how could you how do you play pentatonic scales? How do you play three note per string? And he de develops methods for playing all these things. So he plays strictly in a system where his his plectrum is always sweeping. Um and that's what I mean by sweep technique. I don't mean just utilizing the fact of just going, you know, doing that. I'm on about his his specific way of playing. And he is the inventor for that. He solved the problems of how do you play, you know, uh, groups of two notes or four note per strings. You know, how do you play pentatonics, for example? Um, and if you listen to uh, Gambali sweeping pentatonic shapes, which he has to do uh, using odd numbers, you know, uh, threes, three note per string pentatonics it's a it's a sound which is so incredible um so sorry for that technical thing but that's what gambali brought to uh um guitar playing those of you who want to know the true genius of gambali there's an interview he did with rick beato and it's quite incredible where he really gets deeply into how the guitar works and what's about and i was absolutely transfixed by this and there's one point where he said, well, you know, you do alternate pick. And Gambardi goes, yes, well, I can alternate pick if I want. And then he alternate picks, and it's incredible. So these explorations that Gambardi did were not out of the fact that he couldn't do it any other way. It was purely out of his interest in how the guitar works, you know. Uh, on that video, he introduced the tuning where he's, he's got his two high strings, heavier gauge, and, and, and they're, they're down an octave. Um, and for about... I would say about a year I played with that tuning and I made a couple of albums with that tuning. It totally opened my eyes to thinking about the guitar in a different way and I find Gambali does that. And yet he's not, um, he's not, he doesn't get the credit he's due, which is why I wanted to put him so high on this list. Partly that is, I think, Dan, because some of the albums where he came to the fore in the 80s were, were pretty lame Fusak albums and, and we were sort of searching around for the guitar solos. But since then... There's a whole host of albums where he really does burn. And for those of you who want to know where he, but he, um, he does that, there's an album that he made with Steve Smith and Stuart Ham called, I think, Show Me What You Can Do. I've talked to it elsewhere on the channel. Incredible fusion album. And he just is brutally 
burning on that album. Great producer as well. So that's who I've got at number three is Frank Gambali. So who have I got at number two? Right. I can remember in the early 80s, we're into Randy Rhodes. We're into um, Michael Schenker, Uli John Roth, um, John Sykes. Eddie Van Halen, and we're all, everybody is starting to listen to guitarists and, and they really want to see, hear that shred sound. You know, John Sykes for me was a was was a guitarist for me when I heard him with Tiger Spantang and heard that alternate picking was absolutely incredible. We were all, we were all waiting for that, we were waiting for that. And one day my friend rings up and he bought two guitar albums that day, two. One was Stanley Jordan. And I remember going over and listening to that album, and this was what Eddie Van Halen had been doing with tapping, just taken to an absolute other level. And the other album he bought was Rising Force by Ingvi Malmsteen, and that's the guy I have at number two. Because for me, Ingvi comes in in the early 80s and just goes, right, you want to hear shred guitar? Bang, that's shred guitar. He sets the standard. And for me, when it comes to shred guitar and alternate picking, Nobody has ever quite nailed the brutal intensity with which Ingvi plays the guitar. He, he takes Hendrix, he takes a ton of Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, and he takes Aldi Miola, and he puts them all together into this thing that really just defines for me what shred guitar is. I don't think Steve Vai does, I don't think Satriani does. For me, 80s shred guitar is Ingvi Malmsteen. And I absolutely love the guy. And those first early albums are absolutely brilliant. He doesn't come out playing like these instrumental tracks where he's showing off and doing all these techniques. He comes out with a rock band and that rock band is singing and they're singing about, you know, Vikings and all that stuff that we want, you know, all that, that thing. He's, he's an out and out rock guy. He's got so much front, so much ego, right? And um, I'm sure he's, I'm sure he's a bloody pain in the ass to be around, right? <laughs> With his big ego. But that's what I want when I hear a guitar player, you know. And when I watch him on stage, that ego, I just love it. Him strutting around, you know, with his hair out and his chest out, you know. Sucking his cheeks in and then... And all that stuff he's pulling off. Malmsteen's the man. I, I think he's absolutely brilliant. That's who we've got on number two. What else do you want me to say about him? I... I, I uh, He's done it and he's done it for the past 30 years. That's what he's done. He hasn't changed the formula. You know, he still dresses exactly the same as he did 40 years ago. You know, give guy good on him. Good on you. Good on you, Ingvi. We love you. Right? And, you know, and I, I, I haven't got anything more to say about him. That's it. But I have got him at number two. And I'm, I'm just happy to go tell you all how much I love Ingvi Malmsteen. There's a whole bunch of people on here. You know, Betancourt. Paul Gill, I'm being great to come on and say, you know, I love these, I love these guitarists. It's what I grew up with. This is, this is where I come from. So who have I got at number one? I'll get killed. If I had to put this guy on this list, I would have been killed, right? Uh, and uh, if I had to put him number one, I would have got killed. And he's deservingly at number one. There's so many other lists, like the greatest jazz fusion guitarists, the great rock gods, where people are saying, where's this guy? Well, this is where he deserves to be on the top of my 10 greatest guitar shred masters of all time. And of course, this guy is so much more than that. And you know what it is. If you know your guitar playing, who is it? Yes, Sean Lane. Here I finally get to talk about Sean Lane. What an absolute genius. And this guy is there before anybody, right? He emerges with Black Oak, Arkansas in the 70s when he's about 14 years old. Alternate picking like Malmsteen, he's there, you know, as a child prodigy, right? The thing with Sean Lane is, um, this is one of the greatest technical guitarists that's ever lived, right? He's got, he, he's not a jazz guitarist, but he's got, he's got that in there. He can, he can go towards fusion. He can go towards rock. He can play blues like Steve Ray Vaughan and kick the pentatonics out. He can play neoclassical. He's, and he's, he's, um, he's, his chops are incredible. Yeah, he's unbelievably fast. Yeah, you've got all that string skipping. You've got all those insane sort of symmetrical things he does where he's playing, in some cases, major thirds between each finger and then 
jumping them across the strings, which just sounds like a UFO taking off to me. You know, it's what a sound of you know aliens arriving. It's it's Sean Lane, and he you can also play beautifully. You know, um, in his later years, he became interested in Indian music and explored similar areas with Jonas Elborg that McGoughlin had done with Shakti, but in his own manner, and that stuff's incredible. He, he was a great improviser, you know, so many albums are just him out improvising. He's a true great, so I've told you it, I've, you know, because so many people have asked me about it. He's a true great. The problem with Sean Lane is, the, throughout his career, he just never ever managed to do that thing that would establish himself in any way. He existed at the fringes. There's so many videos out there now of, of Sean Lane, which must have been taken in the 80s and the 90s with people with a sort of, you know, camcorder had gone to some bar somewhere and there's him playing version of Foxy Lady or whatever it is. And they go, oh my God, who's this? And got the camera out because there's so much footage of him out there. And every single time he's stuck in some cruddy venue somewhere. This guy should have been a household name. Um, the same thing happened to Holdsworth to some extent, but nowhere near the level it happened to Sean Lane. Sean, Le Shane, Sean Lane suffered with bad health. He had, uh, I think, because of that, that exacerbated certain, you know, health problems. So he, he wasn't a healthy man. And he dies at 40. Um, and he exists in our memory tr totally down to his ability as a player because he never really had any commercial success. And it's such a shame that the powers that be don't look after these types of musicians. It's just such a shame. Part of the reason why I get angry with sort of the music critics and the snobbery that's attached around rock and jazz and all that sort of stuff is because so often they don't actually value the stuff that should be valued. You know, guitarists like Alan Holdsworth and Sean Lane should have had grants. These are the greatest musicians on the world. But those grants were going to stuff which was to a certain elite intellectual elite that are so often pushing the right buttons, right? So that money is not, is not used to conserve great art. Um, and, and that elite would turn around and go, really, are you saying that Sean Lane is great art? Yes, I am. This is a guy that was an incredible composer, an incredible musician, incredible guitarist, and he, and he was trying to push the, for the form forward. Could you imagine if he had the budget? So you imagine he'd been able to get an orchestra you know, to, to realise his compositions properly. So many of his albums, for me, are just ruined by uh, bad production. You know, uh, um, the the Powers of Ten and, and all those albums, for me, just so so poorly produced. Uh, the album that I sort of grew up listening to was the album he made with Mike Shreve and Jonas Helborg, um, which is called Two Doors. I didn't think I'm about to put... But anyway... You might not, I'll put it, if I've made a mistake, you know, I'll put it in there. And, and I like that because Mike Shreve, you know, uh, being a bigger name, was able to command a bit of budget and that's a well-produced album. And, and they play some of Sean's good compositions on there. Um, and I've talked about that album el el elsewhere. Um, um, and that's the album I grew up because it, it was well-recorded. He just suffered. He's the, whole, the guy suffered in every way possible. And then at the age of 40, he, he finally, you know passed on and it's been a terrible thing since then gatekeepers have come round sean lane and now it, it it's like he's he's held up as almost like a god that can't be touched and i think that's a shame as well uh and i i don't like that and um um any guitarist now that comes in to sort of threaten their idea of what the greatest guitarist is seems to upset them and that's not right because there's no greatest guitarist there's no fastest guitarist there's no anything like this in music at all and this channel you know um is based upon me so often rating things and ranking things but um these rankings are all to do that they're not subjective right these are not subjective there's no way I can put Johnny Marr from the Smiths on the list of the 80s straight guitarists. It's just, I can't do it because it's not all subjective. Sean Lane deserves a place on this list and I've put him there at number one. It, it's not entirely objective, it's not entirely subjective. What it is, is artists create a space in, when, in which we can discuss aesthetics. And when human beings discuss, discuss aesthetics, they're discussing what is good and what is not good. 
And in doing that, we are laying the groundwork for the moral framework of mankind. I didn't think I would get on to this with Sean Lane, but I think I feel very strongly because I believe that Sean Lane is one of the great artists of the last, you know, 40 years. And he should be a household name and there should be documentaries about him and statues and there, there should be, you know. And people are there trying to preserve his memory. And I'm sure if um, his music ever got out of there and they, the, the powers that be had just allowed that, we would be talking about a household name, you know. Musicians that were much savvier, like Steve Vai, which who I think at a very young age had, had come under Zappa's uh, spell. And Zappa was a genius of, of marketing, you know, extreme you know, sort of left field music and turning that into a business. And I think Vi learned from that and was able to make very, very strange music, but make it pay. Sean Lane was not, didn't have that sort of personality. And so um, that's why I put him in number one, because if I could champion the guy here on this channel, which I've now done, I'm very happy to do that. Um, right, so uh, I've got some honorable mentions as well. So before you go, we're telling so, and I'm sure, you know, just as, you know, because <laughs> it's like, I like it when I do like it when you put these in the in the list. But I I like when people go, yeah, I like your list, Andy. And here's some more, you know. And what do you think about this? I like it when it's like that. What I don't like is when people go, you got it totally wrong because George Lynch once. Where's George Lynch? He was so important for the uh, you know history of his guitar playing, and he was. And I've got him here, George Lynch, an honourable mention. Marty Friedman, I mentioned him earlier. What a guitar player! He was the one who introduced me to economy picking. I was trying to play the guitar. I could not pick and I was playing in a way and I didn't know what it was and then I realised, you know, that Marty Friedman was, was playing with this thing called economy picking and I read about it, listened to him and I oh yeah, and then once I knew that I was, be able to, I was able to pursue that as a technique and it helped me as a player. And he does some beautiful uh, playing, as does Chris Poland as well. Another one, um, Jason Becker. Jason Becker is the guy that comes in and, you know, sort of replaces Steve Vai in... Um, the David Lee Roth band, and we all heard him then. And what a guitar player! And of course, he um, he he then came down with that you know disease where um, he's now you know pretty much paralysed. He, he has to communicate through a computer, but he's still out there and he's still making he's still making music and, and you know he's making great music. So I wanted to mention Jason Becker. You know you know Vinnie Moore. Vinnie Moore is is made some incredible albums and was a big name, you know. Uh, and I've also won a special mention to Richie Kotzen. Richie Kotzen's first um, solo guitar album was was mind-blowing, real proggy, complex stuff. He's th since gone on to sort of become a singer and he's got a very sort of Chris Cornell sounding voice and he's toned it all down and he seems to, I think he's just done an album with one of the guys from Iron Maiden, but I'm right at the extremes of my knowledge now. I'm, 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 I'm gonna shut up. I've. I've, uh, I think I've said enough. So anyway, that's my video. If you like the video, like it. And if you want to see some more, subscribe. If you want to support me in these videos, then please support me. I hope you enjoy it. And I hope I've managed to get in some of the cracks of this subject. It's actually quite a contentious subject, this shred guitar thing. And I hope I've traversed it well. And I hope I have pointed to some of the contentious issues. But we haven't got totally into them. Though. So let's see what happens in the comments now. Anyway, thanks for listening. I'll see you on the next video.